is the number one team in the Pac-12 in 2019, and now the top program in the conference. Uh, we got James Voss on the line. Please join him on Twitter, and you can connect to all of his various blogs and podcasts and everything that he's got going on. James, we appreciate you stopping by, as always, to talk Oregon Ducks. Thanks for having me on, Mark. I hope you're well. Absolutely. Um, thanks for asking and, um, uh, certainly got caught up with your situation. So hope everything's well. And, um, uh, looking at uh, the situation in Oregon, obviously every region, every state in this pandemic is unique unto itself, but maybe more so in the Northwest and, and specific to the state of Oregon. So can you catch us up to date on what we can expect in regards to athletes getting on campus and the availability, uh, and, and, uh, the phasing of everything coming back? Yes, that's a, definitely a question that even the people here in Oregon have, uh, at least for full clarity. But spring ball did start at the beginning of March, uh, right before all this happened. Oregon did get in a couple of spring practices, about a week's worth of spring practice, as well as Oregon State. And then everything stopped. It halted. You can assume that a ton of players stayed on campus in Eugene, despite classes being moved to online for that the end of that winter term and now into this spring term. There are many people who have just stayed because they have apartments there, they have their lives there, their friends there, might as well enjoy the school year for as much as you can. Uh, some players may have ended up going back home during this time, uh, as well as some players who maybe were not early enrollees planning to come in the fall for the 2020 class, uh, may have not even made it onto campus. So uh, once this, uh, the whole process in Oregon is, is interesting. There's the applying for reopening, different counties are treated differently. The two counties that Oregon and Oregon State are in, Oregon is in Lane County. They have been reopening in stage one uh, for about a week and a half. That means restaurants are starting to be open outside, seating, uh, slowly but surely, things are coming back. Uh, same with Oregon State. Their county, Benton County, is in the phase one reopening. The Portland area, the large area where I live, about an hour and a half north, starts that first phase one reopening this week, June 1st. Uh, and slowly, everything, you can assume that Lane and Benton County will be moving towards that second phase, whatever that is. But that has meant that now, Oregon announced that voluntary workouts can resume for the players on June 15th, uh, which notably is about two weeks behind a lot of other college football programs, North Dakota State and Ohio State being two of those, the first two opponents that Oregon will face, uh, do get to start or be allowed to have voluntary workouts on June 1st. I think the whole point of June 15th being Oregon's date is that we started to reopen a little later. And so uh, they're kind of encouraging some time for players who may have left the state to return uh, uh, over the course of those two weeks to shore up whatever, whatever they've got going on and make sure we do it in a safe and smart manner. And so uh, June 15th voluntary workouts will start. I imagine since that's still about a month and a half ahead of fall ball that uh, usually starts at the beginning of August, I imagine that that will mean that fall football, fall practice will start on time uh, uh, with only having lost uh, the, the back end of spring practice and the very beginning of what voluntary workouts will look like over the summer. Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. We're talking Oregon. We got James Voss on the line. He's joined us many times to break down the Ducks. And uh, of course, you lose the top 10 NFL draft selection at quarterback. We have addressed the uh, strengths of one Tyler Shook and his um, his scouting report uh, at the quarterback position. Uh, we saw him throw three touchdown passes in garbage time last year, and now Anthony Brown comes in as an experienced player from Boston College. So is this basically what you would consider to, G to be just an open competition between the two for the quarterback spot? You know, I think, and, and we've mentioned – that possibility before definitely with the shortened spring ball and and just shortened practice and opportunity to see uh tyler shuck maybe for the coaches even though they've been able to see him for the last two years in practice uh you could make an argument that anthony brown's experience 
kind of helps assure you, oh, you got someone with live ball with a lot of live ball in him uh, to sort of say maybe that this, this should be an open practice or an open competition. But Mario Cristobal has been clear since uh, from the beginning of spring ball, uh, whatever we had of it, and t right up till the end of spring ball, that it's Tyler Shuck's job. It was Tyler Shuck's job at the beginning, and it was Tyler Shuck's job at the end, and it'll be Tyler Shuck's job whenever we get back to playing football and practice in football. And so I, I think in a lot of ways, you hear coaches, Nick Saban will announce whether it's true or not, this is an open competition. We'll figure out who's the quarterback. He'll, they'll say that. Uh, and and the amount of confidence that Mario Cristobal and this staff have in Tyler Shuck, it really shows even bringing in a grad transfer, uh, you, you convince this guy to come to your school and you still make it very abundantly clear to the public and probably within the locker room that it doesn't mean you shouldn't work. It doesn't mean we don't want you here building up this program and, and pushing Tyler further, uh, but it's Tyler's, it's Tyler's job. There we go. And it's always uh, considering that it's a pretty physical sport, that it's good to have a backup that's got a, a ton of experience at the Power 5 level and can step in and not be overwhelmed by the situation. When you look at the rest of the offense, what's new, what's um, the same, obviously, arguably the best back in the Pac-12 is back in C.J. Verdell and a host of receivers that have plenty of experience, starting with Johnny Johnson. Yeah, the, the running backs and the wide receivers look very similar to the way they've looked for the past two years, uh, and definitely having CJ there and having Travis die right behind him and Cyrus Habibi Likio, they're kind of like two and two A or two A, two B, however you want to put it. it. It's it really kind of reassures you that uh, there'll be consistent running back play. And we know that Mario Cristobal loves to run the football. They'll be running behind a new offensive line, but uh, definitely in ways, especially CJ, just the way that CJ's vision has improved over the course of from the beginning of last year to the end of last year alone. Uh, you can definitely assume that he'll be able to adjust to the new offensive line. And, and once again, we'll, we'll say it a bunch of times, but the fact that they're losing a little bit of that time to kind of grow into each other through this spring ball will be interesting, but I can't imagine that uh, CJ won't be able to take the, the month of fall football to uh, really catch in a rhythm with that offensive line ahead of him. And you mentioned the wide receivers, Johnny Johnson, uh, definitely the most experienced and uh, most decorated of the group coming back. And there's also young guys like Micah Pittman, who dealt with some injuries in the middle of last year, uh, but showed out when he did have his opportunities. And he's one of the most exciting guys on this roster. Jalen Red, who has been the most consistent, I feel like, or the most productive in terms of getting into the end zone over the last three years of his career. And he missed the he missed the Rose Bowl at the end of the year last year, but all signs point to the fact that he'll be back and he'll be productive and he'll be in that that spot, be in the thick of that wide receiver lineup. And Devin Williams is uh, one of the tallest guys. He basically comes in and, and replaces Jawan Johnson. He's the uh, transfer from USC who kind of almost transferred to Oregon State, but didn't transfer to Oregon State and ended up at Oregon. And uh, definitely, along with Micah Pittman, I think Devin Williams is one of the most exciting names on this roster, one of the guys that the fans just cannot wait to see out on the field. So I got the numbers in front of me, saw Oregon play five or six times last year, but in regards to somebody uh, checking out this offense where Johnny Johnson caught 57 last year, you mentioned Jalen Red with 50 receptions. They both found the end zone seven times. Uh, you know, who's the deep guy? Who's the slot guy in terms of specialization? Who does what? Jalen Jalen Red and Micah Pittman are going to be your slot guys. They're a little, they're a little undersized, but they're quick. Uh, they find their ways open and and they move after the catch. Uh, that that's definitely one of their biggest biggest strengths for both of them. And Johnny Johnson and uh, Devin Williams will be your X receivers. They'll be the the out on the wide, uh, figuring it out, uh, going deep. And definitely, you saw multiple times Johnny Johnson got wide open, and, and Herbert could kind of just lob it up to him. Those were some of the highlights you saw during the NFL draft. You're like, wow. I could have made that pass, but I think it, that's a testament to Johnny Johnson's route running ability, his speed for the size of the receiver that he is. He can really put the shakes on a guy and uh, find himself in those wide open situations and make your quarterback both look good, but also look like, wow, what an easy pass. 
not to discount uh, the running back and wide receiver positions because you need good ones, but quarterback and offensive linemen seem to be at more of a premium. You lose an elite quarterback, you lose four-fifths of what many consider to be the best offensive line in the country, uh, but at the same time, you don't. We we kind of brushed upon it uh, before we started to record. You don't seem too concerned. It's really interesting, and and definitely coming into last year, the thing that you said, the thing thing that Oregon fans would say is that all right, we got Justin Herbert, we have a, an insanely decorated and experienced offensive line, and those were the strengths. And then you lose those, and now the running backs and the wide receivers are the things we're confident in but all of a sudden we're not really interested in, in just how much we lost. And, and I think maybe that is definitely some uh, just overconfidence or comfortability. I think there's a lot of comfortability in what Duck fans have seen from Tyler Shuck already. He's got a steadiness to him. It's not even that we think he's this creative, dynamic, crazy guy. He's not Johnny Football, and we know that. But I think, honestly, that kind of eases our mind a little bit, just like, he, he's steady. He's not going to be world breaking or, or anything. He just has that confidence that you don't expect from a guy who hasn't played much live college football. And in terms of the offensive line, I think a lot of people definitely get blinded by the fact that the one guy who does come back is Penny Sewell, the Outland Trophy winner, be, winner of best interior lineman in all of college football last year. And, uh, and uh, definitely someone who you just have incredible confidence in and someone that you can't expect or you can't a lot of people are talking about in terms of uh just future nfl draft prospects uh he may be that dark horse guy that people a lot of people include in the heisman that isn't a skill position uh we know that that's never going to actually happen but he's always there you always have two or three guys around the country that you're like oh don't discount that people want to have that hot take and so i'm fine with being included with penne being included in that conversation for sure john heisman was an offensive lineman people forget but uh, um that's uh, right. uh, definitely uh you you mentioned who we have to fill in on that that the rest of the offensive line and there are two guards tj bass and uh, Male Sala Amavai Lalu, they both come in JC transfers after having played two uh, years of JC ball. And uh, definitely, once again, we'll, we'll, it keeps circling back. When you don't have spring ball, you definitely look towards the guys who have a lot of actual experience. The transfers, uh, the junior college guys, those are huge assets to your team that Obviously, you already know there were going to be assets because of that experience, whether or not you have a crazy offseason like this. But now they really are that big of that much big bigger of a deal uh, when you add them onto your roster. And so Alex Forsyth will most likely be the guy who steps into the center position. And then out at the right tackle, because you have Penny Sewell in the left tackle position, uh, the right tackle will most likely be Stephen Jones. He's one of the biggest guys in the whole program. He's a redshirt sophomore. He played in four games in 28 or five games in 2018. And then last year, uh, because we were so low to the offensive line position, Mario Cristobal decided to only play him in four and uh, maintain his redshirt. So he has, he, he comes in redshirt sophomore. Uh, uh, he has a live football experience, at least a little bit. Uh, uh, and he is, um, yeah, I literally have his stats here. And Stephen Jones comes in at 6'7", 349. Really big guy. He's going to be a tower of a tackle on that other end. And and while a lot of those names are, almost all of those names are pretty unproven, I think while standing next to a guy like Penny Sewell who can, who can teach the guys up and uh, who can kind of elevate the play of the whole line, and as well as having guys who are not unfamiliar with what college football feels like, at least to some degree. Uh, there's a lot of reason to not be so scared about losing four out of the five uh, of one of the best lines in college football. But uh, I totally get what you mean in, in terms of the overconfidence of maybe we're not so worried, but I think there's a lot of reasons to be excited. 